Welcome back to New Amsterdam Radio, the podcast for creatives, thinkers, and doers. It is I, Will Boyce, the mayor in the mayor's office. And well, I want to say over the past couple of weeks, there's been a lot of interest about some of the issues and some of the topics we had in the show, namely about yourself, about the health aspect of things. And so we have, again, the leadership team from the Bio Network here once again to discuss a little bit more how important that is. So along with these interesting, he's become my in-house expert when it comes to things like this. How are you doing, he's interested? Are you good? I am good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah the shirt's great. The shirt's yeah. great, but she is not alone. I'd like to introduce to you one of the advisors here, Poppy Septiani of DBIO Network. How are you doing, Poppy? Hi, I'm good here. <laughs> Excellent. Nice to be with you, <laughs> nice to be with you too. <laughs> and not to be outdone, the chief scientist of DBIO Network, Ibnu Gamal Abaldi. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me here. Oh, it's always a pleasure. So let's get down to brass tacks, the nitty gritty. I was on the DBIO Network website the way, this week, and it said, quote, it's the anonymous first app chain for medical and bioinformatics data. And that was a mouthful. Let me start with you, Ebony. What does that mean to me, Joe Laley? Joe Laley, you know, Joe Layman, I should say. <laughs> So basically, you can you can uh, sequence your DNA, uh, but you can do it in uh, in secret uh, to to save waste. You can you can have your uh, DNA sequence, and then you can uh, then stake it uh, to have uh, 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 so that uh, you can participate in uh, uh, what we call the, the data marketplace and. Uh, in return, you will get a uh, DeFi token as a subsidy. Mm. I know that the mm. uh, not is not very cheap. That's why in DeFi network, it's the user uh, DeFi token as a subsidy to uh, let's say to mm, uh, subsidize the, the money that you uh, pay for the test. Yeah. That, that is okay. So, uh, this is just, let me ask you this, as someone who is a curator of good things, we're talking about data marketplaces before, but when it comes to bioinformatics, how's that different? And what's, the, what is the nuance of that? So, uh, here's, here's the thing. Um, the current biomedical system is, uh, when you actually sequence your genes and you use these, uh, personal genetics testing companies, I'm not going to mention names, but you, all of you know, uh, what they are, <laughs> big bio. Anyway, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these companies uh, have deals, and some of them are like partially owned by uh, pharmacogenetics companies, which uh, who actually utilize uh, your DNA for research. And uh, this is mostly, you know, good research, of course, creating new medicine, uh, new treatment mo uh, modes, computer-aided drug design. Um, uh, but they monetize upon it in a way that doesn't flow back to you. Uh, because when you uh, have sequence your genes and get like this like pretty report of like where your ancestry is from, like uh, your lineage is from, um, that data is uh, in most cases relinquished to these labs. And uh, yeah. that's even not even taking into factor the fact that uh, a lot of these companies have your KYC as well. And not just your DNA, but your DNA paired with your KYC. So there are a few problems with this that we, that we see. First of all is the issue of leaks. Uh, leaks can happen. Leaks do happen. Leaks have happened. Uh, leaks are Googleable. Um, uh, so <laughs> I'm not going to mention, again, not going to mention names. Yeah. Um, so at least one genetic testing company, personal genetic testing company, uh, commercial genetic testing company has been leaked. And that's, that's, that, that, was, uh, that, was, that was really bad. Because Here's the thing, uh, if you're an insurance company and you get access to the set of data and you know that um, Ibnu, for example, is going to have a heart attack when he's like, right. and you don't, you're not, okay. <laughs> I don't know, right. But, right. but if, um, that's- Or that's, say, yeah, or say I, have, I, I have a chance to develop a, a cancer. Let's say for that. Example, yeah. Right, yeah. that's it. Yeah, for that's, example, uh, I have a chance to develop a blood cancer later on in my uh, later age, and then uh, we know that uh, I ma might have the chance to onset the cancer, but I also have 
uh, another chance not to uh, onset. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have it might onset, but I also have the chance it might not onset. Okay. The cancer. So that that's but certain. The insurance yeah. company will. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. The insurance company will have the power to adjust your premium based on that, even though oh, okay. you you might not have that disease in the future, but they have right. the power to adjust the premium uh, according to your genetic test. That's it. Right. Wow. Oh, that's, that's right. That's one. That's that's one part of it. Insurance companies and other companies basically utilizing this set of data, which is related to your KYC, to actually tweak. Uh, some things about your premium, the way you're paying. Uh, the other part of it is your data is still being monetized by uh, by people that you relinquish your data to. And I'm not saying this is a practice for all companies. Some companies are trying to do better, but I think it's, uh, uh, I think what we think is a problem with the way the system itself is constructed. Uh, the way personal genetics companies are constructed is that they provide a service only in terms of actually, get, uh, in terms of getting you access to your DNA. But after that, the question becomes who monetizes that set of data? Um, um, well, the leading uh, personal genetics company uh, in the world has a really high market cap, really, really high. I'm not going to mention the market cap because it would automatically be Googleable. <laughs> but sure, like, sure, sure, sure. The, the really high market cap because of that data ownership. And uh, that's, that's sort of the issue here. Um, so at the same time, we cannot get rid of data monetization because researchers actually need that set of data. So uh, Bio is an entire system end to end that allows you to monetize your genetic data without providing access to your KYC, which is which actually is uh, what you know our, our sort of mouthful on the website anonymous app chain for uh, genetic. And yeah, that's that's sort of where we're headed with that. Um, the idea is to actually allow you be uh, anonymous while uh, your genetic data remains yours. You can sequence it, and then you can sell it on a data marketplace without anyone actually getting access to your KYC and not even having access to your um, actual genetic data. So uh, you can they can only get uh, run algorithms on like the genetic data that you put in but they never actually get access to the genetic data. Uh, so that's sort of what we're trying to do. Hmm. And um, yeah, uh, we've, we've raised several rounds of investment and uh, we're, uh, we have uh, operations in Singapore. Currently, uh, we're uh, active in Singapore as Dow Genics LTD, which is a limited liability company. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, I got overwhelmed there. So I'm gonna, you know, that's, I, I hope that answers. So this question is for you, Poppy. I know that there is a, a lot of, of biotech and, and medtech uh, solutions out there. And a lot of times there are more ideas than actual solutions. And so when you were asked to be part of the advisory board for DuBio, what was one of the things that you had to make sure, how you made sure that it was, was of sound science, of sound knowledge to make sure that DuBio is underpinned by something valid? Right. So maybe I can start from that genetic information is very privacy, it's very personal. But from the customer perspective, uh, we want it to be secure. It has to be uh, private uh, and then uh, it has to be safe for us. So there's no discrimination if our genetic information is open up, uh, maybe open up for the uh, company or, or some other people for the sake of the money. And for a researcher perspective, for example, for me that uh, and uh, with our colleagues who wants to study, uh, for example, a new development of drug discovery and then therapy and then uh, some biotechnology here, some in the medical field to treat some patients of uh, some cancer or for example, the simple one, the type two diabetes, something like that. We need that information of such um, genetic information of uh, certain populations or some populations. So actually we need like big data to be incorporated, to be analyzed uh, in this case that we can find out uh, the cause uh, of the disease, uh, which is actually, uh, rely uh, uh, 
is part of the segment of our DNA in our genome that what that what we want to identify, which probably pinpoint some of the disease uh, that is uh, going to be uh, important for us to 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 develop a new drugs, for example, something like that. So that is um, from the researcher perspectives of um, getting such data uh, from the marketplace. And of course, it is has to be the consensus of uh, the customer. It's a customer decision whether they want to share their data or not. And then we actually uh, didn't need some detailed information about the QIC, about where they live, about what they uh, looks like, what, maybe some basic information like um, age or uh, um, race, or for example, Asian or Caucasian or African, something like that, because it's uh, part of the genetics analysis. And and so when this idea was meant to you about having this this layer of protection and privacy, it was definitely something that you want to go into, or something that you that's has he broken down? Like to me, as a as a lay person listening, I think it's all great. You know, it's all great. Yeah, I don't want the big tech looking at my genomes. It's like seeing me naked. You know what I'm saying? But like, I guess the, there's a bit of convenience there of saying, oh, I just get up, I just go down to the corner and I, I, I do my thing. And so let's make an education process of, to tell people the importance of, of, mm -hmm. of that, right? Poppy? Right. But actually you can be like, um, you can you can get information about yourself, but also yeah. you can contribute to the humanity, for example, to contribute on the research or clinical uh, studies on uh, uh, in the medical field to 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 find a new gene therapy, something like that. So you just need to you know your yourself, but you can also contribute something to humanity. It's it. I think it's really important. But the point is that you can keep that information secure and it's just uh, you don't need to be afraid that it will be sold to a, a big company who wants to take for uh, you know any profit uh, from your genetic information something like that sure uh, and this wasn't for you. You talked about uh, how there are leaks possible for other companies. And I know security is first and foremost at the bio. Is there any other uh, things you've done to, to fortify the security aspect of your operation? Mm -hmm. uh, I do. Uh, it has something to do with uh, what uh, Pandu said earlier, uh, privacy computing, right? Uh, so we have this aggregated data set of uh, genetic population, and we have this data buyer. Let's say uh, some uh, biopharma company, right? This biopharma company wants to develop a drug, a new drug, uh, uh, and they want to uh, use uh, the bios aggregated data set. So they will uh, set the algorithm to the bio so that the bio can run that algorithm algorithm in our aggregated data set and then we'll and then we'll will then send the result to that uh, biopharma company so uh, it will help uh, uh, that uh, biopharma company to develop the drug faster cheaper and safer that's it okay. right that, that's uh -huh. that's another layer uh, 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 that's another layer on top of anonymity, and then we add privacy computing to uh, to secure like uh, the, the privacy of our uh, consumer. Yes, no, I want to add something to it. Well, th th that's awesome. And then the fact that you guys have thought that out, like, because okay, because I feel like when it comes to to new app applications, we always say, "Oh yeah, we're secure," and a lot of companies they are. But there is a little bit of a personal element. I mean, this is not someone showing you, like, you know, suggestive photos of themselves. It's like them from the inside out <laughs> on a molecular level. So right, right, the right, fact sure. that you, you're pushing that's great. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think that that's key. Uh, and uh, privacy computing, as Ibn mentioned, is really, really key uh, to our method. Um, but, like, even from the decentralization perspective, Globo, uh, the way we decentralize uh, the ownership of the data so that uh, everything, everyone has like sovereign ownership 
that actually helps uh, reduce the risk of hacking uh, simply because um, these types of data are usually vocal points for uh, for for hackers uh, because it's KYC linked to DNA, so it's actually very expensive when you're selling it. Um, there's an article, I should send you this article, but like this article uh, says that a single patient record, and this is just patient records without the genomes, uh, is about $1,000 in the black market, and that's just the EMR, mm -hmm. not related to genes. Uh, and uh, genes, uh, there's not, there has been some leaks, of course, but like, uh, you know, selling in the black market is like, uh, depends on like the person, of course, and the KYC quality and also the data quality. But the, there, there are rewards for a hacker to hack a centralized database that is a lot higher than a hacker hacking a decentralized system. So if you hack a centralized database, you get the entire stack of data, all the tables, right? Uh, all the KYCs, all the DMAs. Uh, but when uh, it's a decentralized environment, uh, even if a hacker tries to hack it, they'll only get like a small piece of it, just an individual piece, probably not even get one like it's that, that's sort of like the underlying foundation of security but also as as Ibnu mentioned privacy computing in which we allow people to analyze their data on our premises yeah. we run basically their algorithms uh also means that they don't have to download like in fact they cannot download the data but they can do operations on the set of bioinformatics data that we gather and as as a chief chief executive, what's been the biggest challenge of getting people on board with something that's definitely in their best interest to to have their stuff privatized? So a lot of people are uh, in terms of onboarding woes. Uh, this is a new concept for both the labs and also for uh, the users. So um, we're not creating our own lab. Our mm -hmm. idea is to create a platform between the labs and users. So smaller labs can get onboarded and basically use us as a digital storefront to sell their goods. So uh, they don't have to become like, uh, you know, they don't have to develop their own storefront. They can use their own storefront and take payment in crypto, basically, a simple step. Yeah. Um, and uh, from the other perspective, uh, users, in terms of actually getting them onboarded, we're actually getting a ton of interest, uh, a lot of interest already in terms of the users actually coming in. So uh, we're, we're not seeing a lot of problems with that. Uh, the labs, we also have a lot of discussions uh, that like the, currently a lot of them are like uh, the, the ones that are more interested are the smaller labs um, because they don't have like their own capability to create a digital storefront. They usually just do uh, things like sort of like a in a, in a, in a garage band right. sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's sort of the, so that's, that's sort of why, um, our model actually works that way because, uh, when we actually onboard smaller labs, um, and then, uh, we have many labs, uh, or, uh, around many localities, uh, we'd be able to achieve the same scale of operations as the bigger boys without actually having, you know, just one big lab. Right. And, and, and there's like a, I guess, a lab certification process there. Maybe, Pop, you could talk about that just to make sure the integrity of the labs that you're sending information to. I mean, how's that process, the vetting of, of the laboratories? Pop? Yeah, there is some kind of a criteria that we need to be uh, verified from the testing lab. So, uh, of course, they have they need to be to have that kind of technology on sequence the genome and then some of some certain criteria for example if you live in united states you will choose uh, the closest one to you if i live in singapore i will choose that the lab that is closest one to me in singapore for example like that and then also some um, for example uh, certain uh, requirement to make sure that the data that has been the ge generated by the lab is in a good quality. So it, it, it is really important to verify it and it also to, you know, uh, to see what kind of certificate that lab has uh, owned uh, for their testing uh, uh, purposes, something like that. Yeah. And I, I guess you guys have to recertify to make sure everyone stays mm -hmm. in line mm -hmm. or stays, stays compliant. Right. <laughs> stays compliant. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because uh, the information... 
Yeah, I can. I can uh, from like the tech perspective, uh, we uh, we are creating a collaboration. We have a collaboration with something called the Kilt Protocol. Uh, Kilt is a decentralized blockchain, but focuses on actually doing KYC. So uh, even though uh, the platform is anonymous first for the users, it's never anonymous first for the labs. The labs are KYC. The labs are certified, and uh, we have. Uh, the Kilt uh, token curated attesters, uh, which is a system basically to help us, like to help labs create other labs and bring them into the ecosystem. Um, we have that in place and uh, at launch. Yeah. And so the, the recertification process is just make sure like what every year, every couple of months, you just check in and see if it's up to your standards. And if they're not, you'll make sure that they are in compliance. It, hmm. The idea would be based on uh, sort of the reporting of the. Uh, so um, here, there's something that, like, uh, you can't really do with the current system, like with the sure. with the like without without the bio, you sure. can't really certify that if you've sent your uh, sample to Lab X, you wouldn't be able to certify that. Oh, this is actually my DNA. All right. right? Because yeah, because that that lab knows you don't have like your own sequencer. You don't really have your own like people to actually do the like the analysis, so uh, that's sort of uh, a weakness uh, in the current system. So in the Debye model, you can actually send uh, your sample to two labs at once, and then like uh, uh, the the system basically this is a planned feature will compare between the two labs and basically determine like oh uh, so whether if the sample is totally different. Like the, the 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 analysis of the same sample is totally different than something is after. There, 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 uh, <laughs> right. Of course, it could be on the lab side. It could be on the sampler side, of course. So that is resampled. This is actually basing. Uh, this is actually creating sort of the reputation of the labs and the labs which have like also like bad reputation and bad reputation can also be like non-response, slow response, uh, not. Uh, being able to deliver on time, uh, non-timeliness, um, and reports directly from user, for example, that the reports are not up to par. That reputation system is what triggers basically a re-audit of, uh, of the lab skills. Ah, I, I understand now. That makes a lot more sense about how your business does stick out. Um, well, a question for you, Ibn. I got to ask you from the te technical side of it. This thing is cutting edge. Uh, so don't you worry? Is there any bit of concern about the, the, the big guys peering over your shoulder and, and trying to make their own path to doing something what you're doing? Like, what's been your way to keep what you're doing unique? So uh, if they try to create it and they do it, like one of those nameless entities actually try to do it, that would mean that they would still have only one lap. Okay, so um, anonymity on their end, but like one lab on this end, which means actually they already, they will have the entire aggregated data set and they would be able to monetize it themselves. Uh, with us, the labs, actually all of the labs that are participating only have like one piece of the entire data pie. Mm. Um, and even though we have an aggregated set of data, we will never have access to the KYC. Uh, so that removes the linkage to KYC. Whereas uh, a lot of these companies, uh, like even if they try doing it, they wouldn't be as decentralized as us. And in this case, decentralization is really good. It's not an optional thing, I think. It is actually something that 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 needs to be done to ensure that you know the ownership of rights, the ownership rights data is is maintained. So this question is for you, Poppy. Uh, we're talking about this this great idea. Of, of giving you a layer of protection of having uh, your your genetic testing done with a decentralized system. But we haven't really talked about the human element. Like, why would someone go out of their way to do that? I mean, if, if everyone can can go to Google and figure out themselves 100% medically, no, but why would, why would anyone decide to, to, to sequence their genomes? Because it can be like a prevention uh, for you, for probably, we don't know, we, we are in a probably, uh, our generation inherited some Siri genes from our parents, we don't know. So uh, probably you develop already as any symptoms, for example, having a developing cancer or, or kind of type two diabetes, for example, you want to know uh, your blueprint through your DNA, through your genome, so that you can uh, make a prevention plan 
uh, not to having that destiny of having, for example, type 2 diabetes, for example. Or uh, you can make a prevention plan. Uh, for example, you need to uh, eat some uh, good food, uh, good diets, if you have higher risk of having cancer. That is, uh, we already know uh, our DNA, it probably make us more aware uh, of what kind of, for example, therapy or what to avoid. For example, you can have a, a allergic reaction of some drugs or medicine. So in this case, you already, you know, you're not uh, just give up with your faith. Uh, you, you can change something. For example, not to have the diabetes, not to have that um, cancer by uh, having a um, good diet or some uh, therapy that is uh, suit and customized only for you, for example, like that. That is, the, that is the why, actually. But most people are afraid to know their destiny, for example. <laughs> they, don't, they don't want to know uh, their DNA because they don't want to know what I'm going to have in the future. So I just live like this and I'm just going to live my life like this. So whatever happened in the future, I don't want to know. For example, there are some people like that. It's okay. But if you want to, to be more, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm quite sure the knowledge that we have will keep us uh, in a good track of um, uh, in this life, for example, having good quality of life for having good um, for having good, um, you know, health conditions, for example, like that. And, and is it safe? And do you recommend people do it as well? It's very easy because you just need we just need for you know, the testing lab just need your saliva from for mm. your mouth just uh put it in a sample kit and then send it so it's it's not invasive i mean it's very safe and then they will uh uh collect your samples and then put it in some um uh device which is um what we call next generation sequencer and then then they will read your dna segment you have mm. around three giga despair. You only have four letter actually, ATGC. That mm -hmm. four letter is the code of your life. That four letter consists of, you know, three giga uh, in size. So, uh, and every person has different uh, combination of that four letter, which is, uh, could be the genetic variations that probably will um, you know, you can be, you can be, uh, for example, if you have one DNA, it is in the letter A for a normal person, probably the sick person will be in the letter of T. That's what, what, what we want to know. So this is, um, this kind of information where you will know whether you possess any risk of certain disease or inherited disease. Just simple as that. So. Don't worry about that. You won't get any, uh, you know, you don't, we, we don't dr withdraw your blood or something like that. You just need yeah. uh, something simple from your mouth. It's the cell of your mouth. And then uh, that's enough samples for the, your DNA. And then the lab testing will do the rest. You just wait for the data come to you. Question for you and if you then, I mean, if it seems simple and it can give you so many benefits, I don't see why you wouldn't want to do it. Uh, I guess it looks like if this is a, a situation now, unlike the big tech where they can use it uh, for nefarious purposes, it seems almost like you, it's almost like a good idea to do it. What's been the hesitation for some people? Uh, well, in my opinion, they are afraid to know what uh, the future holds for them. So some people uh, are not ready to know that kind of information. It's it's scary to to know what uh, illness that you have inside your body that will develop later in future. That uh, what scares most people. But uh, the advantage of doing the genetic testing is uh, you know out out like uh, it's it, it's even better. For you to sequence your DNA because you, as Poppy said earlier, you will have you, you will pair 
uh, for things that might happen to you in future. So you will be uh, even more ready to face it like that. That's 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 my uh, two cents on it. In fact, uh, it's 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 very easy for Preset to me uh, back then uh, when we started this project. She only uh, she will only uh, sequence her DNA if the bio is uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 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 in service. You know, you know what I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, one of the most because, because, thing that people uh, yeah. are afraid. Uh -huh. Because Poppy is uh, a lecturer of the largest, uh, the biggest university in Indonesia. She's the lecturer of bioinformatics, so she knows what uh you know uh it is better for you to, to sequence your dna but in private so the right. bio comes with that uh, solution right. right if uh, the lecturer of bioinformatics say that i will follow once the <laughs> right. bio is on i will sequence my dna too <laughs> in uh, the bio's ecosystem maybe i'm the first customer uh, then i <laughs> said <laughs> faith in your products yeah, why not can, and also, I can analyze my own data, actually. That's, <laughs> that's anonymous. <laughs> yeah. Right. Surreal. <laughs> right. Uh, DJ Tristan, uh, as the chief, chief executive, has there been any early success stories or wins or winning people over to the concept of the bio as it's matured? Um, we have won uh, several awards at the beginning of the year. Uh, we won at ETH Denver, uh, which is the largest Ethereum uh, largest Ethereum event uh, of the year, I think. Um, and and uh, we won two awards. Uh, one is the IPFS Award for Identity, and the other is the United Nations SDG Award uh, for uh, Sustainability. Um, we have also become, like, of course, like, if you count fundraising as successes, we have raised uh, 250K at our seed round, uh, and uh, we're currently raising a strategic round, and we've already raised around 100k uh, for that, uh, and we're still raising. There, so there's actually a lot of interest from the investors as well. Um, and uh, from the technology stack perspective, after being on Ethereum, uh, we this is very techy, but like we moved over to uh, the substrate blockchain within two months. Then we moved over again, not moved over, but like we re-implemented the entire thing on something called the Octopus Network. So we effectively have shifted and expanded our our technology stack um, within only uh, like within only two or two three months, uh, moving from Ethereum to uh, other blockchains. And uh, yeah, and we've 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 been doing a lot of. Uh, We've been we've been having a lot of media coverage as well. Uh, CNBC Indonesia has covered us. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, news outlets cover us as well. So I count that as a profit as well. Um, yeah, that's that's sort of sort of what we're focusing on. Uh, and uh, we are launching uh, the actual uh, token that is related to the bio. Uh, that's going to be in September. Uh, that's planned. Uh, I think that's something that we're finalizing for now. But like from the previous successes, we're quite uh, certain that that's going to be a success as well. One of the coolest uh, features of, of the bio testing is, is the electronic medical records. Uh, I know when I was, I don't go to the doctor uh, frequently. So I know my information's all over the place. And one doctor is talking to this doctor and his networks upon networks. Uh, so I guess you talk to me about, more about that. What does that look like to the end user uh, being able to access their electronic medical records? So here's the thing. Um, the the idea behind current electronic medical records, uh, and there's a controversy about this, is uh, there's a conflict of ownership rights between patients and physicians. Um, patients demand that they be given ownership of their medical records, while physicians actually claim that they're the rightful owners of the medical records because they see it as work result and it must may remain protected under intellectual property law. Um, and each country, this is actually different. But like in, in Indonesia, Actually, it's decided the ownership of medical records resides within the patients and uh, it's only put within the hospital servers for convenience. Okay, so um, so anyway, the the way we are actually doing electronic medical records is sort of different from like the other uh, blockchain solutions that are, that are doing that in that we are doing it in a user first perspective. 
So if you already have like um, your own medical records that you want to upload into the blockchain, you put it in the blockchain and you secure it that way and you ensure that, oh, this is what I got. This is what I received. And uh, you, can, you can anonymize it yourself. Like you, you basically edit it, edit out your name, etc., and make sure that uh, like um, it's still connected to you as your set of data. And, and uh, you basically can can send over to like you can prove that oh this is this is my set of data. I own it. I have to ask for uh, a second opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, to a doctor, to a doctor that is also certified on like the bio, uh, um, the same kill token created the tester the KYC thing. So uh, yeah. imagine, well, what was it? WebMD? What's the website? Yeah. Web Web you question. look up all your symptoms and they tell you you're gonna right. die. With your symptoms, you give like you, you can. So imagine that, but like it's blockchain. So basically, you can give your symptoms. You can give your entire EMR. You edit out your own name, make sure it's anonymous, make sure it cannot be traced back to you. It's uploaded there, and then you give a bounty. Like, uh, I'm gonna give you like uh, 500 bucks if you can tell me tell me what's wrong with me. And uh, yeah. that that yeah. is that can be an escrow, a smart contract. A real doctor, uh, as in someone who is actually certified by Kilt to be in that specialty, can give his or her opinion and claim the bounty. So uh, that's sort of a very different way of doing electronic medical records. Of course, the hospital is are still keeping the records. So it's, still, it's still on their end. But at least since the patients have a copy, the aggregation of the data is done with this system. Because like you, you probably have like not just one, but like, you have multiple medical records that are spread throughout multiple hospitals, right? Except right. if you live in Singapore. Because Singapore actually aggregates their data themselves, which causes problems. That data was hacked in 2018. Singapore oh, was wow. hacked because wow. it's a centralized system, right? Again, the centralization problem of, of, of these medical records is that it's precious. It's, it's also very valuable. Hackers hack it. Happened in 2018. Very Googleable. You guys can search it. Very public. The prime minister's data even got hacked because the prime minister was part of that electronic medical records thing as well. So anyway, wow. so uh, so right now your medical data is probably unaggregated it's not aggregated so uh you were born in a different hospital you move cities flobo i know mm -hmm. so you have like several hospitals that are like you you know i i don't I, i'm not saying you get sick much but for medical right. check right right um now uh imagine <laughs> our solution first as sort of a personal medical journal where you uh where you uh, have your own health records but then afterwards you can utilize it to uh, request for a second opinion uh, from a physician that uh, can be from the other side of the world, but you know that they're a physician because you know it's already curated by Kill, and then you mm -hmm. can basically pay them through this system as well. So it's an entirely different system from like the rest of the bio that we've been talking about. Um, it's an exciting part of our solution as well, uh, and it uses the same infrastructure, uh, sort of, uh, and uh, maintains anonymity in the same way. With so many things being offered for the Dubaio uh, network in your, in your app, how does an end user get involved? How can they sign up? How can they learn more? How can they get on board with your technology there, Ibnu? Okay, uh, basically uh, users can uh, download the decentralized app and then they could generate the uh, public key and private key for themselves. And then they, uh, uh, let's say I'm a user, I'm going to have a uh, my, my DNA sequence so I'm going to uh, download the digitalized application. I'm going to log in anonymously without KYC at all. So I'm going to generate public key and private key at the same time. And then I'm going to uh, opt for uh, the type of service that I want to do to my DNA. Let's say I'm going to, do, to have a whole genome sequencing and then I'm going to pay for the service. But before I pay for that service, I opt I choose the closest lab from my uh, location, and mm. then I'm going to simply, uh, and then I'm going to simply swap my buckle, uh, my 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 cheek, the inside of my cheek, and then I'm going to put that uh, DNA sample into an envelope, and then I'm going to uh, write down a let's say a code. It's a similar like a Swiss bank account. It's only a number that. Uh, that identifies you 
since you're, you're not putting any KYC over there, that number represents you as a customer. And then after that, you're going to send that uh, sample, DNA sample into the closest lab that you chosen, that you have chosen earlier. That chosen lab will then uh, 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 run a quality control to this. If it's, uh, uh, if it's up to R in terms of quality, uh, then uh, the lab could proceed with the uh, sequencing. After that, lab could upload the uh, genomic data of the user of my DNA into back into the uh, decentralized app. And then uh, the the app will ask me as a user whether or not I'm going to stake my genomic data into the aggregated data set that I'm uh, that we're going to uh, put on the ocean markets like that. Mm -hmm. In return, if I say yes, the data staking, I will have, uh, I will be given uh, the bio token from the bio now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so sounds great. I, so I like the fact that uh, there is an onboarding yeah. path to get more involved with it, yeah. <clears throat> so we are in 2021, hopefully, the global pandemic is behind us, crossing fingers. Uh, but that was really a, a, a wake up call to see how information uh, could be used to prevent something like this, or could it be used to influence something? It's interesting, let me ask you this. And when it comes to health crises uh, that go beyond the individual, how can DeBio really play an instrumental role in helping with that? The pandemic isn't over in our area of the world. Uh <laughs> <laughs> sort of Indonesia is still locked down. Uh, still locked down. Singapore is still locked down. So you guys are lucky. Um, but yeah, I, I think one of the uh, one of the things that the bio can help with is, uh, of course, in terms of testing. Right? We need more testing, and we need more high quality testing as well. Uh, the way we do testing now still requires us to leave our houses. Yes, there are uh, types of quick tests that that are available. And uh, those those can be done by yourself, but like uh, uh, there might be like uh, other tests that are related to the disease that can be uh, uh, done through the bio. Um, so uh, that is actually another part of this. Uh, we what we created is sort of an infrastructure for people to send in samples, biological samples, and receive results in return, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, the result could be DNA, it could also be, oh, you're positive for COVID or you're at high risk for COVID. Um, and uh, anything that can be sampled by yourself, DIY, is something that uh, can uh, use this use this system. So um, um, anything that relates to that uh, would be very interesting in terms of actually, uh, you know, uh, helping people get tested and helping more people get tested without actually leaving the house uh staying at home uh, and not risking themselves going to the hospital to get tested and secondly um the idea uh of the bio uh is to allow people to not get uh like oh, okay so so because of the pandemic a lot of people are avoiding going to the hospitals because uh they're scared a lot of people mm. are scared um uh and it could be like you, you can argue whether it's rational or irrational fear, but uh, like the hospitals are where like you know the COVID patients are as well. Yeah. So um, a lot of that's what a lot of people are thinking. So um, they they don't do medical testing, they have medical checkups, which you should do once a year. Um, they they don't do don't do any of the things that they need to do uh, to ensure that they're healthy. Um, so uh, actually using uh, the, uh, the bio for actually first of all. Um, genetic testing, may, uh, knowing exactly uh, where you're at risk at, and then uh, uh, basically, you know, um, 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 changing your lifestyle to fit and, and avoid uh, the issues. And secondly, basically doing testing that is uh, required, um, like the medical checkups that can be done at home, uh, all of these things that uh, that can be uh, uh, can be tested, um, can actually. Uh, help people survive the pandemic better uh even without you know leaving the house uh and this is not just for covid patients these are people who are you know probably already uh, beat covid but like they they are still at home because of the lockdowns and but, like they still want to get tested uh, for other things uh, as well 
the, the, the last part of this is something that sort of a bugbear for me. A lot of countries now are starting to implement vaccine passports. And uh, that is uh, that could be an issue, to say the least, mm. because there is the, that, that centralization of power is not something that is good. Um, that's why EMR is actually part of this as well, because, you know, your vaccine records are actually your electronic medical record as well. Um, and, uh, you know, making it portable, making it uh, uh, provable on blockchain and making it uh, into something that is not directly related to your KYC. Uh, like uh, if it gets uh, yeah, something that you can show that, yeah, I'm, I've already been vaccinated, for example, um, would be a step in the right direction. Uh, although, you know, I, I still don't like even the concept of vaccine passports, but at least when you have it in a way that is more decentralized, um, that would actually uh, help in, you know, uh, not ensuring the centralization of power in like just one group of people or one, like, you know, like this, this is... This is sort yeah. of, um, it's, it's not political, I promise. This is focused on, you know, the security of it all. Uh, having uh, data in one place is simply not a very good idea. Having data in your place, basically having data sovereign to you is the way to go. And uh, this allows it while still making it portable. Wow, that is fantastic. Just before we get out of here, I just want a quick personal question for you, Poppy, as, as being an advisor for this. Is from what you've seen and what people have, have asked of you, where do you see DeBio out in, in the years time, like from the medical side? Sure, it's a breakthrough, I think, because we need uh, this kind of platform. It's the peace of mind for the customer and also for the researcher when we get we can uh, get that aggregated data. It is very useful for us to develop, for example, vaccine for the COVID-19, uh, because we already have that such data, uh, like, like the database of the genome of those people who wants to uh, contribute on that. That's really important, knowing yourself and also contributing to the humanities. I think it's very cool and um, you don't need to be worried about your data uh, privacy because blockchain will help you on this. Absolutely. I'm so glad you guys were around with your new episode of New Amsterdam Radio. If I wanted to learn more, it was, there's a lot of information about this testing, but I want to learn more about that and the DeBio network. How would I go about doing that? You can actually just go to DeBio.network or just Google DeBio network uh you you would be able to find us uh so um on, on that site there's a white paper which is sort of like our primary concept there's a deck uh, there's an overview of the concept in a, in a more visual way uh we also have a blog which is blog.bbio.network uh, that you can go through uh there's a lot of uh discussions there that are actually very interesting we've uh, spoken about like U.S. healthcare data controversy about the conflicting, the conflicting ownership rights between patients and physicians. We uh, explained further about for your uh, for your techie-minded audience the the bio architecture um, um, and like what the, what why we chose the technologies that we chose. Uh, there's a uh, also a section about how the bio basically revolutionized genomic research. And that's all on blog.dbio.network. And I think that would be interesting for you to visit. Yeah. And also if you go to the Biotech network and hit that link on the bottom, you can join the discord and get discussion in live time. I'm there. I'm not sure what I'm doing. I'm like to watch and listen to discussions. <laughs> Usually I'll say something maybe, <laughs> but make sure you check that out. Uh, so until next time, this is new Amsterdam radio, the podcast for creatives. This city is yours.